Well, greetings, autoethnographers. I'm going to uh, drop a um, sample presentation here on you. See if we can share screen, get this thing going. All right, good. Here we go. Um, so we can put our little, it looks like I'm going to, my big fat face is going to be here during the presentation. So you should have to live with that. Uh, let's see. And here we go. Okay. So um, I, um, I studied uh, two of my very favorite poets here as part of my uh, sample autoethnography project. Um, the first is Charles Wright. Um, and then the second is Charles Simic. And of course, uh, I examined my own writing process. Um, as part of this project. So just a quick background, uh, Charles Wright uh, swam into my ken, if you will, um, back in 2007. Uh, I had started to teach um, uh, American literature at a local high school and, um, and came across a poem of his called uh, Two Stories. Um, it was set in a place I was familiar with, well, part of it was anyway, uh, which was up on Mount Leconte. Um, in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And I just, uh, I loved how uh, unbelievably evocative the poem was. It was part of a, um, a collection of his called The Other Side of the River. And he's published, you know, I want to say something in the neighborhood of, of 20 to 30 uh, collections of poems. Um, he is a lyric poet, meaning that um, he, uh, his work is predominantly um, not concerned with, with sort of a storytelling element, although he'll he has said in numerous interviews that there is a, um, uh, okay, so he, he speaks Italian, uh, soto narrativo, which means an, an under narrative, uh, sort of an undercurrent of narrative. So there's a, a connection among the, the various elements in his poem, in his poems. And so um, uh, Other Side of the River was his attempt at writing narrative poetry. But even when you read it, you'll see that it's um, it's highly lyrical, uh, meaning that it's, it's a, um, it's more sort of associative uh, things, imagery, um, you know, elements of figurative language and so forth. So um, uh, Charles Simic then was, um, had been named, um, I think Poet Laureate, uh, the, the, the year that I'm talking about, or maybe uh, a couple of years before, and, uh, and read some of his work. He's also a highly lyric uh, poet and just uh, really loved his work. Plus the two of them are friends and um, I've read exchanges of letters between them that are um, that are just uh, I mean like it's, it's like a master craft uh, craft craftsman class in uh, in poetry writing. Okay, so let's take a look at Charles Wright first. Then, um, so his first collection uh, written in 1970, uh, Grave of the Right Hand. Uh, he did his um, he came out of the army, um, went to Davidson College undergraduate, and um, and then went to the um, uh, to the University of Iowa, a super well-known MFA program. This MFA stands for Master in Fine Arts. Um, and he says that he wasn't uh, really looking at, uh, at poetry as his, uh, as his focal point, but uh, he, he sort of just um, a confluence of factors uh, led him to end up focusing on that. Um, he has said that his, his poetry influences were uh, reading Ezra Pound's Cantos, uh, back when he was still in the army uh, in, in Italy. Uh, this is, I want to say, in the late 50s, early 60s type thing. Don't, don't quote me on that. Uh, but in any case, so his um, uh, first published collection then is, uh, is Grave of the Right Hand. In 1997, he won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for Black Zodiac, um, a marvelous collection of poetry. And then in 2014, he was named Poet Laureate of the United States, in case you don't know what that is. Uh, the librarian, librarian of Congress names a poet each year who acts as something like an intermediary between uh, sort of the world of poetry and the, um, uh, and the public school system in the United States. Okay, so relative to, uh, to timing, um, he said that in his early days, sort of the 1960s, he wrote in the afternoons, uh, unlike anyone else he'd ever heard of. And uh, he said that he had, um, while he was translating a couple of Italian poets, so he's got um, uh, books of translated poems, um, Cesar Pavese and, and Montale uh, among them. And he said that he worked in the mornings then, but, um, but generally um, he worked in the, uh, in the afternoons. Uh, so 
one of the interviewers asked him if he had a, um, uh, a regular routine. And his comment was um, that uh, when he worked on something, he worked on it every chance he got morning, afternoon or evening. Um, so his work came in first, but not into sultry ones, meaning um, that without a pattern. OK, so. Um, then he says for a uh, for as organized a person as he is, his writing schedule is wholly erratic. Um, this is kind of um, uh, was an interesting response to a question that the interviewer asked him. The uh, the Paris Review interview that I read um, was uh, was conducted in in Wright's home in uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia. He was a professor there for um, many many years, um, and had had like a um, you know uh, what was the uh, what was part of a, a chair. So in other words, he was given a um, uh, there's sort of a title that um, and this this chairmanship pays for his pays his salary. And so we taught classes and and whatnot. But uh, in his study. Uh, there's just a whole collection of things from his um, uh, from his past, and the interviewer described his uh, studies being highly, you know, organized, like a place for everything and everything in its place. Um, okay, but but the point being that um, that he doesn't have, you know, sit down at a regular time every day and get after it. Uh, the the poet Ted Kuzer, um, who is um, uh, you know marvelous poet, has written some books on on poetry writing. I uh, talked about when he was first writing uh, in in uh, in early grad school and so forth. I first started writing his poems while he was a night watchman at a uh, Stokely Van Camps um, facility, which I think is hilarious. Uh, but he's a very small man, and in his uh, first apartment with his wife, when he started writing poetry serious, I think it was in grad school, he had a um, a refrigerator box that he had opened up and made into a um, into a writing studio. And so he said he wrote basically the same time every night inside the box because he had to enter his sort of poetry world. Um, so in terms of uh, Charles Wright's process, uh, so as you know, that um, that first collection comes out in 1970. But then by 1980, um, he's got a collection called the Southern Cross when he um, started writing things differently. Um, and so what he means uh, by uh, tending to do it more in situ um, he writes each section, gets each section the way he wants it, instead of going back over a full draft of a poem. And he says of the um, of, of the uh, not just the writing, but the revision process in particular, that um, that this is always difficult, um, meaning that it's I mean, it's it's draining um, to to do. So I want to give you an example of, uh, of one of his poems here. So this is um, looking around three. And this is actually from that collection. Uh, called the Southern Cross. And so um, you could press pause at this point if you want to read the poem. But what I'm showing you here on screen is a uh, is an example of how uh, many of his poems look. And that is to say that you'll see them written in in these sections and each section is um, is delineated by that line there uh, that that uh, both sort of connects them and um, um, and sets them apart one from the other. Um, this this view of his lines, um, where you've got the the flush left stuff, but then you have also uh, like that the the fifth line there, screen shift at meadow mouth. He does that a lot um, in in terms of he'll have one line and it drops and extends toward the far margin. So as you probably know, the difference between um, among the differences between poetry and prose is that um, with prose, you generally are gonna have a, um, a, a well-defined left and right margin. Generally your, your prose is, or your text is, um, is justified uh, right and left, uh, but poetry doesn't have that. So, uh, so where the line ends is a, uh, is a significant uh, piece of the poem. And it's also a subject of, uh, of highly, um, you know, sort of fashioned or crafted uh, decision making on the part of the poet. Okay, so anyway, I just want to point out if you take a look at each one of these sections, you'll see that uh, that there is a um, is an underlying connection to them, but each one's distinct. Okay, so let's go on to Charles Simic. So Simic uh, in 1967, his first collection is uh, What the Grass Says. In 1990, he wins the Pulitzer Prize for uh, The World Doesn't End. Uh, this is a collection of prose poems. And then 2007, he's named Poet Laureate of the United States. So uh, relative to mat material and um, 
So he says he scribbles in little notebooks or on pieces of paper with a pencil or ballpoint pen, uh, words, images, lines of poetry, where, wherever he happened to be. Um, and then at some point he takes that to the computer. So this is consistent over a, a handful of, um, of interviews on Simic that I read. And um, uh, so, so he's always carry, he's, he's got something with him to write on. Um, and, um, and so just wherever the mood strikes him, he'll put some things together. Um, so this is, this is from, uh, that's actually the title of one of the interviews, you know, um, in a, uh, I want to say a semi-popular um, magazine or journal where it's like Charles Wright, or sorry, Charles Simic, you know, writes in the middle of the night. And so he says that, uh, you know, if he's awakened by an idea, um, he doesn't want to, uh, uh, to wake his wife up. So he just sort of uh, scribbles in the semi-darkness. Uh, which is uh, which is kind of funny. And the, the, the interviewer asked him questions about, gee, do you think this is why so many of your poems take place at night? Um, and he sort of laughed and said that um, that maybe that did have something to do with it, but he wasn't, uh, you know, couldn't confirm or deny that that was the uh, kind of a major influence um, on his uh, work and where they're set. So what he says is that, um, uh, that generally a word comes into his head, then a phrase, and then eventually a poem begins to take shape that he may tinker with for years. He's also said in interviews that um, he has um, intentionally um, put together uh, ideas. Like he's worked with, uh, I think, the poet Mark Strand, where they were doing some, you know, sort of what I'm going to call invention workshops, where they would be thinking about ideas um, and uh, sort of almost throwing stuff out at random and then trying to make a connection uh, among the um, among the things. This is actually a semi. Um, uh, I'd say it's a potent um, way to go about writing poems. So like prompts that I've read, you know, by prompt, I mean that it's something that gets you to write. Um, you know, prompts will give you, you know, say a list of, of five words and you try to include those words in the poem. And it's amazing how, uh, how associative our brains are and trying to put stuff together. So this is, uh, this is how Simic um, occasionally will, will work. So on his writing habits, you know, uh, he says here that, um, you know, he's 75 at the time that this interview was conducted and um, that he's he's tried everything um, that he's, you know, uh, late at night, early in the morning, um, you know, and this sort of thing, just to um, to see if there is uh, is one uh, time that works better than another. And so just for, for what it's worth, even though he's he's now much older, he's in his 90s, I think he's in his 90s. I think he's just just in his early 90s. Um, but, um, you know, you, you tend to need less sleep, um, or maybe you just get less sleep when you're older. Um, so he has said that, uh, that now his sort of nocturnal habits are starting to dominate, uh, in a, in a great way. Um, so when he talks about, about that most like writers or artists tend to have a, um, a specified routine that they're like ritualistic about it, his, um, his belief is, and this is, uh, from his own experience and also in, in talking to. Uh, to other poets uh, with whom he is, um, you know, very familiar. So he's part of a, um, a fairly broad reaching poetry community that, that poets are different in how they work, meaning that they, uh, they tend to be not quite so, um, so ritualistic. Maybe it's just because the idea is that, um, that poetry is not um, so, so readily defined as other works of, um, of art and literature are. Um, and so he's uh, then reveals here that he has basically no ritual associated with his writing work. Um, that that it, that again, it's it's sort of impulsive and um, uh, and based kind of on feel, I suppose. Okay, so in terms of uh, is inspiration, I'm just gonna I'll like give you some info from part of the interview, one of the interviews that I read. Um, so now he says here that um, uh, the music he listens to while working is the sounds of pots and pans while his wife is making dinner. Uh, which sounds very romantic and, um, uh, and beautiful. However, in other interviews, he's revealed that he has listened to other types of music when he's worked, um, uh, predominantly uh, classical and instrumental. Um, so one, one thing that's interesting about that, and, and I don't know if it's the way it is for him, but it is you know, sort of for me that, that um, I found that um, unlike if I'm writing uh, something that's non-poetry, um, if I'm if I'm like inventing, uh, you know, starting a poem, I tend to need complete silence. But if I'm if I'm doing a revision, it really doesn't matter what's going on. I just sort of zone in and 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 everything else kind of goes away. And uh, he has revealed that that's sort of what uh, what happens for him as well. Um, 
so he he says he likes to walk if he um, is trying to you know so if he's suffering from you know writer's block or um, or feels you know the need to write a poem or the desire to write a poem then he'll go walk and things sort of shake out uh, while he's doing it. Uh, I find the same thing happens to me when I'm out running. Uh, so then his um, uh, his inspiration. So he talks about uh, having no idea how they started or why. There's nothing clear cut um, where you'd say yeah this is the way I work. Uh, but again, as I said before, um, he has also experimented with the idea of beginning with uh, with words, uh, images, uh, things of that nature, and then trying to uh, uh, to sort of associate them, link them in his uh, in his writing. All right, so now we're on to um, uh, yours truly here. So um, I actually, for what this is worth, I, I didn't. I think I might have written some. Um, you know, like when you're in college, you know, you um, you sit down and you write some poems, and and uh, generally it's it's a it's a makeshift diary. So something you know something weird happens to you in your life, you know, you get broken up with, or uh, you know, or you you have this inexpressible longing for, you know, some significant uh, some person that you wish would become your significant other, and uh, it either is not happening or it um, uh, you know the relationship you thought was going great just like ends abruptly. Or, you know, or something else, um, you know, terrible happens um, uh, to you. It, it generally, I, I guess sometimes that you might want to write poems in college when something great happens to you, um, like maybe out of this, you know, maybe the, the, the person that you were longing for, um, you know, suddenly um, makes you their, um, uh, their beloved and, and you're so excited that you start writing poems. Uh, generally, these kinds of poems are terrible. Uh, mine were absolutely god awful. Um, because I had no idea what I was doing, even though I was a, a, an English major and studying poems. Nobody ever talked in, in my literature classes about, about uh, like how poets worked or, or even how poetic elements um, work together to, to reveal sort of the, uh, the central obsession or, or central impulse, kind of main idea of the poem. So uh, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, it wasn't until probably 2007 when I was uh, now having to uh, teach American Lit at a local high school where I felt compelled to, uh, when, when I started getting questions like, you know, we're, we're interpreting a poem or, or whatever, and they're like, oh, well, how do you know that? And so then I started to dig down into uh, to more craft-oriented things. And as I did so and, and began to kind of understand, um, you know, how, how poets did what they did and what the effect was, I also went through a, was going through a divorce. And so this was like uh, letting off steam for me. So I started writing poems. And um, so then uh, in like uh, 2008-ish, um, I applied to and was accepted to a, a brand new poetry uh, program, a master in fine arts program at Drew University, which was staffed by some unbelievable, I mean, like really, really well-known uh, national poets, uh, Gerald Stern, uh, Jean Valentine, um, Ross Gay, um, you know, a, a whole host, Michael Waters, Iris Sadoff. I mean, these are people that are, are relatively well known in the poetry community. And so uh, Alicia O. Stryker. So I had the, the opportunity to work with these people and, and then just like totally blew up uh, from, from there. So uh, th this first poem gets published um, in the, the Great River Review and, and it ends up getting um, nominated for a push cart uh, prize. So this is a prize that is awarded to uh, an array of poems that are published at small presses. Um, so Stern Sonnet, which was written um, after a, um, uh, a sort of informal interview that I had with Gerald Stern uh, during one of my uh, uh, residency periods up there in, uh, at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. And so recently um, have had um, a poem published in the Chestnut Review. Uh, two days after Ash Wednesday, I read Charles Wright in the Moonlight. Um, and, and this is me sort of um, uh, as a taking off on, on some of the, the kinds of titles that he has done. Um, I just admire his poetry greatly and, and wish that I could uh, write in, in his manner. And some of some poems I have, and actually the ones that I've had published uh, quite often are, are the ones that are sort of in his manner. So I'm trying to, uh, to better understand that as I, uh, as I go forward. So um, I, I don't write every day. Um, or haven't at least over the past, you know, a decade or, or more, primarily because I'm, you know, like teaching and, and doing whatever and just haven't, um, haven't gotten into that, um, uh, that routine. Although uh, every Lent, um, so I, I give something up. So let's just say it's, you know, uh, meat or, uh, or sugar or, you know, alcohol. 
you know, not that I'm a big drinker, but, you know, so I give something up and then I take something on. And the thing that I generally take on is a commitment to start writing a poem every day. Um, so for the roughly the 40 days, I'll, I'll start a poem draft. And um, uh, so I, I, I have to do this and I want to do it um, as a, you know, sort of part of my, you know, remembrance of um, in some in my faith tradition, you know, Christ and all that kind of thing, uh, what, what he sacrificed. Um, so I start at like 8 p.m. like every night, sit in the same chair, and it's the chair I'm sitting in uh, in right now. Uh, although generally I'm facing that direction. Um, so with the laptop, got this five dollar uh, IKEA lap desk, and and I'm basically in close to total silence when I'm working on um, on the poems. Okay, so uh, during this period, then I'll write basically Monday through Saturday. And on Sundays, um, I, I will, will, will then look at the poems that I wrote earlier in the week and like tweak them up. Um, so what I end up, what ends up happening is that um, I try to get, you know, 12 to 15 finished poems from that group of like 30 or 34 that I started during Lent. This year was unbelievably productive for reasons that I really cannot um, uh, understand, but I probably got 25 like solid, no joke. Uh, poems out of um, um, out of this past Lenten season. So in terms of like inspiration, like what do I end up writing about? about? So um, so during that like Lenten period, you know, I'll start each day with a prompt. Um, so and here's an example of a prompt. Take the last line from a poem you admire and use it as the first line in a poem of your own. Um, so there's there's all kinds of, uh, of books out there. And I've got a bunch on the shelf over here that, um, you know, they are, uh, you know, they'll give you prompts. And so like, if you, if you go to a, like a workshop or something and, um, and say you've got a, a workshop leader, then they'll give you a prompt um, to, to kind of get you writing. And, and this is kind of the fascinating part about it. It's just like in, in your, uh, you know, your classes in English classes in college, I mean, you're given an assignment, right? Which is a glorified, although formal prompt uh, that you end up having to write into. Um, so, uh, when I say I don't think much about the prompt itself, so if I've got a book over here that's got like 100 prompts in it, um, early on, I used to like uh, read, like flip through the prompts and then say, oh, gee, which one is speaking to me? And I realized that that doesn't really help very much, um, that, that it's it's an avoidance strategy. If I sit there and try to assess, um, oh, this prompt's going to work or this prompt's not going to, I just, you know, basically go on page one and, and then like um, I'll type out the prompt at the top of my page. And then I just write to it, whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it, sometimes it works really, really well. Sometimes it just works okay. But most times it works. Um, so this is um, uh, kind of the cool part of this, uh, this process. So as a result of this study, and I mean by like this autoethnography project, um, I really started to read more about, about what other poets um, do, like what their process is and so forth. And, uh, and as a result, it's, it's made the way I'm thinking about my own work um, less sort of, um, uh, you know, fragmented, like dealing with, you know, um, with poems, sort of ideas that make themselves into poems, like one at a time. And I've started to think more about craft and um, uh, about what, what it is that makes my own work, you know, kind of, um, you know, my own. Uh, Charles Wright sort of, in an interview that I read, this is, I find this to be an absolutely fascinating idea. Um, so generally when you start to write, and, and as we've talked about in class, if I were um, left to my own devices to teach, um, you know, uh, composition, then I'd be having you read the work of, of accomplished and interesting writers. And then we, we would do stuff like uh, imitate their styles. We'd understand their style, uh, you know, study it, and then write stuff that, um, that is an imitation of their style. Poets do this all the time. And so like in my MFA program, each, each mentor that I had uh, for each semester would give me like, you know, six or seven or eight collections of poetry to read. And then the idea being that, um, okay, write in, in sort of imitation of, of their style. And because these mentors knew that I was a narrative poet, so I, I, I tend to tell stories, that they would have me write or have me read um, poets that were semi-narrative in, in, um, uh, in their approach or their style. But then as I, as I got pushed further um, toward the end of my two-year program, um, then the, um, the poets were having me read stuff that was, was going to like push me away from straight up 
beginning, middle, end uh, type narration. And, and so this is how my, my poems tend to, um, uh, are starting to work now, which I find um, you know, fascinating. So the, the point about Charles Wright, sorry, is that um, as he's beginning his poetry writing um, you know, journey, He's, of course, reading a lot of other poets and is writing in um, in a style that is or in a manner that is like theirs. And he talks about in the grave of the right hand, um, he writes a poem that he realizes that is entirely in his own manner. And that is, he says, no one else could have written this poem. That's like it's just like a mind blowing idea Okay, that no one else could could have written um, that particular poem because its manner was um, uh, wholly his own. Okay. Uh, so, which I think is really cool. Uh, so in terms of revision, so revision is the, is the foundation of my poetry writing process and it's, and it's become more and more so over the years. And um, um, it's uh, with any kind of writing, it's become more and more important. So for your own writing, I'm just going to you know, point out that, that it's um, uh, super helpful for you to think of it that way, that just like banging out a, um, um, a first draft or whatever, is is not you know and, and thinking that that's going to be sufficient is just not going to work because cognitively um, writing doesn't work that way. What's in your head and what's on paper are generally two different things. And there's like a um, a weird like Jacob's ladder that goes from uh, from what you think's in your you know is on the page and what's actually on the page. So um, quite often with uh, with student writers in the past, you know they'll they'll you know I'll give them feedback and they'll. And they'll squawk about the stuff that I've said. And I'll be like, well, just read it out loud. And they'll read. So I'll say something that's awkward. It doesn't make sense. And then they'll they say, it makes perfect sense to me. And I'm like, well, just read it out loud. And they'll read it out loud and, and hear that like, what? Okay, because, and they'll say, that's not what I meant. And I'll say, all I got to go on is what you said, like what's there. So th this, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to illustrate to you that the um, uh, super important thing uh, for you is to is to revise and as part of the revision process, read your work out loud. This is the most important thing I can tell you um, that that will improve your writing going forward. Um, and I'm talking about like whether it's an email you're going to send to somebody. So let's say that you're you know you're ticked off and <laughs> you're going to send an email like a strongly worded letter. Um, like before you send it, read it out loud and, and, and assess your own tone. And what you'll find is that generally your tone's too hot and you need to like you know back it off. Um, or a, you know, a, a love letter you send to somebody or, or even like a, um, uh, like a cover letter for a job that you want or, you know, anything like that. Reading it out loud is the, is the best way for you to, to assess what it is that you're saying. And I've probably said this in class, even better is to read it aloud, record yourself reading it, and then listen to the recording. Like it, any, any sort of, um, Dopey mistakes or, uh, or or a sense of disconnectedness is going to, th these things are going to emerge immediately uh, if you go through this process. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, so while I'm doing revision, um, th this this runs. This is kind of counterintuitive to what you might think, where you're like uh, the revision process is you on the on the hunt for errors, um, which is part of the process. But really, if you are gentler with yourself, you know, more like uh, forgiving and and um, um, and supportive of your own efforts. If you look for the best writing that you've done and then bring everything else up to that level, it's a super useful um, uh, process. So like I, I used to paint, uh, so you can probably see some paintings behind me and whatever, but um, like it, when you're painting, if you, if you change like the value, so like the, the density of darkness or you know, shadow or even like color, um, as soon as you make a change, you're going to have to like adjust everything around it to, to, to match up with that, that original move that you made in the, in the painting. And then you'll end up going back and, and you may end up changing that first value, um, uh, you know, correction or, or move that you made. And now it's this, like, it's this cycle that happens. Same thing happens in, in writing and especially in poetry writing you. So I, I look at this and say, this is good writing. I try to move everything up to it. And now that I've, I've consciously, you know, done all that, then I'll go back to the thing that I initially thought was really good and realize that it's, that it itself has got some, some weaknesses to it. And now I can adjust that and then start, you know, and, and again, continue this process. And so quite often what happens is that the, that the poem is finished when it feels like there's no, no improvement to be made. Okay. 
So same thing can work with your own essay writing. All right, so uh, this is totally critical and I've just started doing this recently, uh, as in like in the last year, is imagining a, a specific reader. So in my case, because I'm trying to get a bunch of poems published so that I can then submit, a, um, submit my manuscript for publication, I've started thinking about uh, imagining like what what do the uh, what does the editor look like while they're like while they're reading my poem like um, so the, I, I envision them sitting you know at a desk or sitting in an armchair um, and 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 they're pulling my submission up and so like what's what's happening with them like what do I want them to uh, to feel or respond to when they read my poem so so to envision um, what they look like is um, is a very useful thing. So I, I used to be a marketer, um, and and we used to do this when we were doing marketing and advertising campaigns. We would um, do th this sort of um, uh, we would generate a profile of the people that we we're trying to approach, and and so you know, uh, woman aged twenty five to thirty five. She's got two kids. She drives a Honda Odyssey. Here's the kind of um, you know magazine she subscribes to. You know, she watches, um, here's the kind of TV she watches. And so here's the kind of clothes she wears. She runs like three days a week, goes to the gym two other days as a personal trainer, da, da, da. So if you start to like um, drill down on, on what your audience is like, so whether it's, it's for, you know, for, for me, if you're, you know, looking at me as the, um, as the audience for your, uh, for your submissions or, or, or anything that you do in your writing life, it's going to make a, a huge difference in, in how effective um, what you're putting down is going to be. So then um, my objective in, in, in writing poems is, um, is to move the reader to feel something. I mean, because otherwise, if, if somebody walks away from something you've written, like, eh, you know, where they're, they, it's like they, they're indifferent toward it. You know, it, it's like in a, um, uh, you know, in the world of love relationships, you think that the, that the opposite of love is hate, but it's not, it's indifference. Okay, at least with hate, you've got some emotion going. So if somebody feels uh, indifference towards you, it's that just is that's the grossest thing that can possibly happen. So uh, sorry, I'm going on this tangent. Uh, but 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 in, in poetry writing, that's what I want is is for someone to uh, to feel something um, that that's akin to the thing that moved me to write the poem to begin with. And so like if I if I'm you know reading the poem and and I start to feel emotional about it, and this happens you know periodically, I know that's a good poem because if if it got me. Then I know it's probably going to get um, get somebody else on a human level. All right, so that that's all I got to say about this. Um, I hope that this was a a useful thing for you, and uh, I'll see you in class.